So Claire Harris was a prolific uh, painter with more than 300 paintings identified thus far. Harris sold some paintings during her lifetime, but it appears that the majority of her paintings remained unsold and were acquired by collectors in the years since her death. Clara Isabella Perry was born in King City, Ontario in 1887. She traveled to the United States for study at the Art Institute of Chicago in 1907 and subsequently attended the Ontario College of Art in Toronto, where she studied with noted Canadian painters, J.W. Beatty, Archibald Barnes, and other instructors included George Agnew Reed, Manley MacDonald, and William Cruikshank. Although she studied with the noted portrait painter, Archibald Barnes, that I've just mentioned, at the Art College, this is one of the few portraits that we know of Landscape was her preferred subject. The portrait is presumed to have been completed before her marriage to Fred Harris, a commercial artist in Toronto in 1918. Other subjects, other traditional subjects that the artist would have attempted as part of her training include the floral still life as you see here in the installation in the living room at River Brink. And this uh, larger still life on loan uh, from the collection of Les and Arlene Molnar in St. Catharines, a lovely floral still life. But the majority of the work in the exhibition is landscape. Harris traveled extensively in Ontario and to other parts of Canada and the United States painting en plein air, often with her friend, artist Emily Louise or Elliot. Much of Harris's early work is closely tied to Toronto, where she painted on locations in and around the city, such as this one at the Center Island Lagoon from 1922, and Harris lived with her husband in uh, Valley View Gardens in Babby Point in Toronto. Other works such as this one you see on the far right, Berry Road, bottom of the Humber with no date. So these are some rural sites, places on the margin of the margins of the city, uh, places that have been absorbed into the growing metropolis in the years since these were done. Scenes such as this one provide a record of an earlier time. A number of paintings were completed in and around Port Hope while Harris attended the Summer Art School. The Port Hope Summer Art School operated from 1923 to 1934, but was forced to close due to financial, uh, financial pressures of the depression. So this is a lovely scene, uh, no date, but a distant view of the school, the main school building, and here a contemporary photograph of the site that uh, is still work, still exists in Port Hope, still uh, actually operating as a, an art school. The OCA Summer Art School, organized by J.W. Beattie, was an important site for training teachers for art instruction, in addition to aspiring artists who attended classes. It therefore played an important role in art education in Ontario. While at the school, students were given assignments and set out to work on sketching out of doors, then reassembling for critique by the instructors at the end of the day. Students often painted the same subjects from different perspectives, such as this very scenic bridge. The date suggests this was possibly the final semester before the school was forced to close in 1934. These paintings capture the rural countryside in Southern Ontario, a place of farms and pastures, old mills, barns and sheds, which, which today we may view with more than a hint of nostalgia. There's this lovely view of a farm, again, from a distance, 
and we get a sense of this lush green, uh, perhaps heading towards fall with these uh, uh, changes in, in color, but the title we're given is Glorious June. So imagine a rich, uh, lovely Ontario countryside uh, just coming into the heat of summer. And here we have the old mill from 1932, another very scenic view. The barn and shed, these wonderful uh, lush greens and then um, the gray blue of the barn uh, in the background. And here is an, inst uh, an installation view of how the room uh, looks as it's um, installed. Quite a number of, of works we managed to get in. And this one, the old elm tree, also on loan. With a another side view of the, of the wall. Painting also took Harris north to Halliburton and Bob Cajun and Bala, a few of the places noted on paintings. At times she re recorded the location, sometimes the season, occasionally the year. It's not clear if these were intended as titles or only reference, but it provides us with an account of her progress and her itinerary. This is one of my favorite paintings in the exhibition. Summer Road Between Buckhorn and Bob Cajun. Harris has captured, I think, the particular light and the color and the feel of the landscape of the near north, which I know as cottage country. Others might know it as a rural community, a community with, har with farms and businesses, and uh, just before we closed for the uh, pandemic, one of, we had a group of three students from Niagara College coming in uh, to, to film the exhibition. And one of them was actually from Bob Cajun. So he found this uh, just a really uh, lovely reminder of home uh, in the summertime. And another visitor was really quite strongly convinced that this was the road going up to her cottage. But these depictions of the landscape of summer cottages and fall colors and a rural farm heritage are why I have characterized Harris's treatment of the landscape as Arcadia. What this means is that the landscape she has depicted is one of a retreat, a respite from the city. It has a long heritage going back to ancient Greece and an anti-urban sentiment. Arcadia is a place of escape. It's an imaginary place. The idea is that food is plentiful and the weather is pleasant and the people are welcoming. In fact, we know that life on a farm is not the bucolic experience we might wish. It's a life of hard work, of long hours, sometimes heat and drought and crop failures and in the north although the summers are lovely and the fall colors spectacular there is a, there's isolation and long winters and the difficulty of making a living in a harsh climate in canadian art history landscape is often linked to nationalism to national identity and similar ideas have circulated in other countries in the grand tradition of Western art, at least since the 17th century. In 20th century Canada, the group of seven worked at the forefront of the creation of national identity tied to landscape painting. The prominence of wilderness rather than farmland or industrial or cityscapes in their work celebrated the country's untapped resources it was a vast wilderness without people, but one that promised wealth 
through mineral extraction and lumber and water, all elements that appear in their paintings. Clara Harris also painted the landscape, but she was less focused on the pure, inaccessible wilderness as a subject. In the Harris paintings, which are very skillfully executed, landscape has been tamed. It's a settled landscape with a road through it. So I'm going to uh, end my part and ask our, uh, the rest of you to join in today in our conversation. So if everybody, not sure, I'll try and unmute us now. And Elizabeth. Okay. Deborah? Yes. This is Verna. It's got Francis McInerney here, but it's Verna McLean. I wanted to join your lecture today. Okay, great. <laughs> well, great. It's great to have you. <laughs> Thank you. It's nice to be here and see the exhibit. Yeah, such a disappointment for, for all of us and for all the exhibitions, you know, just, I mean, a few people did come through in those, uh, in those weeks after it went, or the days actually after it went up and, uh, but then uh, everything shut down and we've recently started to open up and again, we're inviting, we have, we've had a few visitors uh, since the beginning of the month. So that's been great. Good. That's on your site, isn't it? The days when people can visit and how they should call in for an appointment. And yes, that's right. Because I want to let all the collectors know, so hopefully they can come and see this, like book their time and also um, hear your video and your lecture. Yes, well, we'll, uh, we'll post this um, on our YouTube channel so uh, others can uh, join in or can can watch and and um, enjoy in, and then perhaps that will prompt them to come in and uh, and see the exhibition. So any any questions or comments or we've really had uh, some very nice responses that so people are quite appreciative of the work. It's soothing and pleasant and I think we need that now. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I think um, the paintings look great. Uh, it's so nice to see them, the way you have them presented. It gives you a real chance to appreciate them. Mm -hmm. Like the detail and the colors and uh, Clara's students, the two I interviewed, uh, one of them said that Clara really knew how to mix green. The color green said mm -hmm. nobody mix the, that color like Clara. Right. And you really see it with your Bob Cajun one here. Yeah, it's and how different it is from the green of Southern Ontario from, from farm country. I, um, it, it's, a just, it's a different color, it's a different shade and it's important to get that right. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah, well, it's been great to have so many of uh, so many paintings in the exhibition. I think that gives lots of variety. Uh, the installation looks beautiful. Really thank you. Good. You're welcome. What are your hours now? Well, I'm um, well we are taking visits by appointment. So um, oh. to Tuesday to Saturday. Um, and we have a schedule. I think we give people an hour and a half um, time, but we also have had people drop in. So the, um, uh, the information is on our website if you want to uh, book an appointment. There are some questions beforehand. We ask everyone wear a mask, we clean in between visitors, that kind of thing. And so did they go around? Wednesday to Saturday. I don't know what I'm talking about. Wednesday to Saturday. So, Deborah, do they go around themselves? Yes. Or? Okay. Yeah. But we're there if, you know, there are any questions. And uh, we've, um, 
we've put some information uh, we're using um, an app uh, or just a QR code that you can access with your cam with your phone with your camera on your phone to for other information about the work the exhibitions just to eliminate the uh, contact with with papers and that sort of thing in the gallery so all the challenges that we're dealing with makes it a different world mm -hmm. her art becomes more important <laughs> Yes, that's what I meant by, you know, this, this respite and it's just a calming, just a very pleasant um, experience. <clears throat> it's Ontario light too. Like this. Yes. Yeah, light. Yeah. Quality of light. Yes, and that's that's something that European artists kind of uh, really struggled with because the light in Canada, the light in Ontario, it is very different. It's a harsher, uh, harsh, uh, difficult to capture that accurately. And I think that's one of the reasons this, this particular landscape, of, you know, I, I recognize the skill in that. I think it's not as harsh as the prairie though. Right, right. It's Didn't almost they have, crisp. Go ahead. They had trouble with the sky, accepting that the Canadian sky was the color that it is. Didn't they? The European landscape painters, they thought that the sky looked unreal. The way yes. the Canadian painters, the color that they used. Yes, and, and part of that is, is because of the light, because it's... Um, it's strong and, and harsh and, and uh, <clears throat> it's not the soft muted color of, of Italy, for instance, or, or France. So yeah, very different, in, or England even. Oh, my daughter was in England. She said she, well, she was born in Saskatchewan. She said she missed the sky. Of Saskatchewan. Well, she was born in Saskatchewan and lived here, but both Ontario and Saskatchewan. She said she missed the sky when she was in England. Right. It depends on your perspective. She, a, so. a prairie dog would prefer harsh, as we call it. I would call it dark or crisp or brilliant, mm -hmm. especially in the winter. Well, I think it's, it's different to, you know, when you're not used to it, that's, you, you notice it and ha you know, have, to, have to adapt to your practice for, again from, I don't know how someone like Turner would have uh, approached a Canadian <laughs> landscape. It's kind of interesting to think about, isn't it? And I saw an exhibit from the AGO. It said he was actually uh, painting smog. Yep, smog and fog and, and that has a particular effect on the light also. Also meant uh, Monet in, in uh, late 19th century France and England. And I think of the Hudson River School, there's a kind of a misty, mistiness in that landscape. Well, I'll, um, I guess. Uh, is this Verna? Sorry. To Verna? So, collection of Verna. Is this Verna yeah. here, that we're yes. talking to? Yes. This yeah. is your. How lovely. I this Francis, but I'm Verna. <laughs> so, how many do you have of hers? I have um, pro over, I would say over 100 paintings. And then there's. Of hers? Yes. And I wow. have. Wow. I know. I have a lot of um, ephemera and some correspondence and actually I was just looking at some of it the other day because my daughter's gone to Gloucester, Massachusetts for a little vacation. So I said, while you're there, make sure you photograph 
these scenes because she was there. But more importantly, her husband, Fred, he painted a painting and sent it to her with the address where she was staying in Gloucester. So I was able to say to my daughter, when you get there, please go and photograph the house because it's still there. And you know, that was also an artist's community. So I think it could be pretty interesting, but I wouldn't have known that if I didn't have some of these other bits and pieces where Fred wrote things about Clara or to Clara or sent her supplies or, it's quite fascinating how you can fill it all in and it's like a huge puzzle. You're it's a detective. Finished. Pardon? So how did you get interested in Clara Harris? Well, I, I really, my mother was an antique dealer and um, Clara came into her store near Jane and Boer in Toronto and said she was going into assisted living and could my mother, would, would my mother be interested in buying some of her work? So my mother looked at it and she was like, oh, this, these paintings are really something, especially because they have the titles on the back. And they were, so we had an idea of where they were and when they were painted. So from that point of view, even if you didn't think Claire was the most skilled artist in the world, this is a recording of the Canadian landscape. So my mother bought as many as Clara would sell her. But Clara, um, she wouldn't sell you anything if she didn't like you, you know? And she, there were, there were people who would come to her house because she'd have exhibits at her home. And she, she would, certain people couldn't buy anything. So my mother was lucky. And then when she died, and then my father died, the house was full of stuff and I had to clean it out and there were all these paintings in the closets. And, and I remember when I brought one to Deborah, the um, glorious June on the farm, which Deborah spoke about, Deborah said, wow, this is so fresh looking. It looks like it was just done. It was like, if you'd seen where it was stored, just thrown in the closet, you know, a bunch of boxes and, so that's how I acquired them. And then um, there were so many of them, and my husband said, you should do something with these. And that's how it started with the website. And I get contacts all the time. People are still sending me things, and I had no idea it would become such a big, a big research project. And it's continuing on, and I'm building an index to for all the paintings because there's so many of them and different people have them and I want to make sure it's not lost because I think it belongs to Canada and should be maintained so that's really what I'm doing yeah so we're very fortunate to have them on loan to Riverbrink I think it's been a nice uh, a nice exhibition for us and our focus on women artists for this, uh, this season too. Well, thank you for having them there. I'm just sorry I can't see them. Yeah, yeah. Who would have thought? the same era as Emily Carr? Uh, there is some overlap. Carr died in the 40s, so she would have been an elderly, uh, an elderly colleague, yes. Yeah, because she wasn't really, she was only recognized because of uh, the group was seven and was much later in her life. She did so stop Clara painting. Harris. Yeah, she did stop painting for a number of years and, and was really living in, ve in very dire uh, circumstances and got a burst of attention from members of the group, yes, in the late 20s. Um, and then um, participated in an exhibition uh, that was at, in Ottawa, Toronto and Montreal. So, so she's just slightly like older. Sorry? She's slightly older. Oh, Emily yes, Carr right. is slightly older than Clara. Yes. Yes. But they right. would have faced the same sort of uh, barriers of, to recognition as a woman artist. Yes. And, and, and uh, Carr being on the West Coast also, uh, the isolation there. Are we frozen? No. No? Okay. I don't We're good. 
had a little pop up there. Well, that's really sad. She really never got a lot of recognition during her lifetime. Well, I think some of it was, you know, she, she was a modern woman. She was out there, but at the same time, she also helped her husband with his commercial art. She would go um, to some of his clients in Toronto. She spent time supporting him too. So exactly, and also she wasn't in very good health. We're not quite sure what she had, but to me, it seems like she had some kind of um, thyroid problem or Graves' disease. Just described in the diary. Um, so she spent a lot of downtime, you know. But she was in some yeah. good exhibits. And hey, were, oh, good. And it's, how it's old did she live? I'm sorry. How I, old I, is she when? How old was she when she died? Oh gosh. Well, she died in 1975, so she was. Oh, that's pretty old. 80s. Late 80s. Yeah. yeah. She did what she loved for most of her life, you know. And um, it's important to remember that it's it's never easy to make a living as an artist mm -hmm. in Canada, even today. <laughs> There are many, many, you know, you think of someone like Fred Varley that we celebrate today. He lived in poverty through much of the 30s and the 40s. Very little money, only, you know, rescued by a patron. Um, it's, it's, a, it's not an easy uh, life. No. And the ones who have recognition now maybe didn't receive that in their lifetime. That's true. Like Andre Lapine. Mm -hmm. Pretty well died with nothing. And now is, he has that museum up in, where is it, Aurelia or Minden? Minden. Um, it's in Minden. Yeah. Yeah, the Agnes Jameson. That's really due to one patron who liked his work and thought he was important and collected it and donated it. You know, Carr later in life was, well, through that period, didn't have money for materials. So she's thinning her paint with gasoline and painting on. Mm -hmm just paper, just brown paper, butcher paper. No money for the proper uh, materials for painting. See, I think for a lot of the women artists during that period, they ended up teaching at schools. You know, but men did also. That's true. Men also had, you know, would support themselves in that way. Arthur Lismer taught, uh, Varley did for a time in Vancouver and some of them were essential tech. They taught there too at the art department. Yeah. Because one of Clara's students went there and so she described a lot of the teachers to me and the instructors. So yeah. I was surprised to hear that I didn't know that. So mm. maybe teaching art in, in schools as opposed to, you know, maybe in an art college or what we would consider to be post-secondary or adult teaching. But um, yes, I think teaching was uh, an important way of, of supporting yourself as you try to paint on the side. I've seen photographs. I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was Mary. I don't know if it was Mary Rinch, but one of the women taught it. Um, it was either Havergal or Bishop Strawn, and they have the the picture of her with the students all around her, uh, you know, the easels up and just interesting stuff. Yes. Um, Florence. Oh, it was, is that who it was? Was it Bishop Strong or however going uh, on? Uh, I'm forgetting her, her name, but I think I, I know who you mean. Yes, and it's interesting to see the photographs of OCA and you, you, you notice that three quarters of the classroom, the students are all women, but it, it is the men who, whose names we know who went on to yeah. have careers. Yeah, that, that's kind of my, what, what I'm getting at is the artists, the Canadian artists that we recognize from this period are mainly men. Mm -hmm. And what? obviously there were women and pro and probably this it's inter it's a woman's perspective of sort of the um, as you call it the, um, what was the name of this the uh, you know the more rural than um, complete wildness 
Arcadia, the, the treatment of the landscape. Okay, no. How is that related to the term Arcadia, or is it the same term? Well, it, it's, um, it comes from a province, an area of, of Greece that was popular oh. for, for a, in ancient Greek times for uh, the philosophers and the poets to leave the city and to go out in, in this, into, the, into this uh, rural area as a kind of a retreat and to get away from the city and just to enjoy uh, the beautiful landscape and, and the food and the wine. Mm -hmm. And so as a respite, that's how it, and it's, it's a term that recurs from time to time. And it's a way of distinguishing from, let's say a landscape that is um, an industrial landscape where there's you know, the potential for resource extraction or the Garden of Eden, uh, which is wild and overgrown. So there's different ways of, of portraying a landscape. It's not, they're not always the same. Is it related to the term for French Canadians from the East Coast? Is it the same term or is it a different term? Like Acadians? I know this is Arcadia, A-R-C-A-D-I-A, Arcadia. Okay, it's not just the same term pronounced differently. Okay, thank you. I don't know where I can, I, I don't know. It might be the French version of it that um, I'm not They considered sure. it rural to the, compared to Paris Acadie. or Montreal? Acadie. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I the like sublime, new words. Yeah, the sublime Art. landscape is different. The romantic landscape Art. is different. So, very, yeah, very different treatments. Okay, well, um, if we're coming to the end of our time, this has been great uh, connecting with you. With you. Thank you very much. It was fun for me seeing I'm a hostage here. <laughs> I can't come up there, so. Are you able to get out though, Verna? I think it's debatable. I. Uh, do you feel you want to stay in? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Let us out. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Uh, we'd like to come back. I, I think a lot of it, you know, we, we're not sure. We have to look up the policy in terms of um, if we came up. Like, we are Canadians and we do have our passports and everything. But even if we if we came up, like I know the borders closed, so whether we have to fly and then you'd have to stay in quarantine for two weeks, it's like yeah, you drag too. That's pretty much it. That's the situation for now. Yeah, I don't know when it's going to be different, but I think you're wise to keep us out the way it is here right now. Yes. So. Yeah, it's really exploding in the States, so it's very concerning. Keep up the good work there. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad that we could connect at least with just a small group today, um, but, it, you know, keep connected to our audience in this way. It's, I think it's important. Great. Well, so I I, some of your other lectures, and I'll keep in touch that way for now. Great, great. So thank you both for, for joining. Thank, thank you. you, Deborah, and thank you, Verna. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, I just want to walk down that road right now. I know. What? Yeah. Now Where do you hang it in your house, Verna? I'm sorry, what? Where do you hang it in your house? Do you have this hanging in your house? I, I don't have it. Most of them, I have them cataloged. They're here, okay. but I have racks for them. And then my, okay. husband, my husband and I, we switch them around. Like if oh, it's summer time, you have yeah, more like a summer scenes and then the winter, that I do winter ones. But um, that's, that's more of a main road now. I've been there and taken photographs. My friend and I 
I had to find the right road and oh, yeah. website, but it was fun to, to go to these locations, see how they've changed. Yeah. That's not fun, but right. Um, well, are. Riverbrink had a movie a while ago. I'm sure you remember it, Deborah. That they um, found all the locations for the Group of Seven paintings. Yes, that was a lot of fun. That was, that was stunning. Like I just, yeah. it, it took my breath away. That was amazing that they'd have the picture and how they found them. Mm -hmm. And they'd have a picture of the group of seven painting and they'd have a picture of the actual scene. Mm -hmm. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, well, that's a lot of fun to, to come upon those. I know one site that I've been to is at um, Bun Echo Park. And there's a, a painting and a poster that A.Y. Jackson did where you're looking across the lake at the petroglyphs. And oh, there's, yeah. there's a little figure in a boat fishing and um, it all looks really lovely. And then, but when you're on the site, you realize that the spot he painted really? from is the porch of the lodge. <laughs> so I imagine sitting there in a, in a chair and, you know, as A.Y. Jackson did looking across the lake. And we canoed by those petrographs. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great... Uh, I was, and I've, I've seen the painting, I think, but I've never connected the two. That's amazing. Yeah. That would be an easy one to identify. Yes. There aren't. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but it's, it's the combination of the petroglyphs in the background and the, you know, the little boat or canoe and then just the expanse of the water. And then when you realize, oh, right here on this front porch of this lovely rustic uh, cabin that was the lodge there. You can almost hear the loons. Yes. Yes, I just was up in Rock Cage and actually two weeks ago and uh, oh, I heard the loons. What, what are you, the petroglyphs, are those the ones in Peterborough? Y yes, oh. around, near Peterborough, Bun Echo Park, uh, Provincial Park. Because isn't, I went there and there's a lake on the way in it's on a, um, it's, it almost, I thought it was curved lake. I mean, it was so mystical. But my friend said, no, no, that's not curved lake. But it was just beautiful driving into them. And to me, that's like the Canadian landscape too. It's just like, whoa, this is really something, you know? Yeah. The trees are so dark and then you just see this lake and there's nothing there except the lake and it's quiet and... Beautiful. Yeah, that's Canada to me. That's right, yeah. yeah. I consider Niagara the tropics. <laughs> yes. Okay, well, um, again, it's been lovely uh, connecting with both of you, and um, hopefully we can uh, meet up in person at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Someday. Someday. Yeah. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, ladies. Take care. Talk. Thank you. Thank you.